Hi everyone, this is Miriam Naimi from the Alan Turing Institute and Newcastle University. Welcome to the Smart Charging webinar series. Today's talk is on Danish experience with electric vehicle charging infrastructure. The aim of the webinar is to find out who is doing what on electric vehicles and uh, charging infrastructure with the objective to, when possible, collaborate to roll out a fit-for-purpose uh, infrastructure. As an example, in the UK, uh, there is some uh, policy development happening. Uh, so we're planning to introduce regulations in 2020 on charging infrastructure smart charging, for example, and uh, the policy principles to be addressed are grid stability, uh, cyber security, data privacy, and interoperability. In addition to the policy uh, developments, there's also a target that the government introduced, and they want to see all new cars and vans to be effectively zero emission by 2040. And uh, in order to achieve this target, government has described how it's going to do so in a document called the Road to Zero. Uh, there is also funding available. For example, there is 400 million pounds available to support, develop fast charging infrastructure, but also there is 30 million pounds available, for example, to develop vehicle to grid charging infrastructure. In the previous webinars, we heard about uh, the Dutch experience uh, on charging infrastructure. We heard a bit about the UX experience and on the landing page you can find uh, the YouTube recordings, also the slides. Uh, in the future webinars we will hear in more detail on the US experience uh, with a focus on California. This webinar series is an activity of uh, the SuperGen energy networks, which is led by Newcastle University, and also an activity of the Vehicle Grid Integration Group of the Alan Turing Institute. The Alan Turing is the national institute in the UK for data science and artificial intelligence, and uh, one of the objectives of the institute is to apply data science to real-world problems, in this case, how to integrate electric vehicles into power systems, for example. Today's talk is by uh, Peter Buck Anderson from uh, DTU. Uh, Peter has been working on vehicle grid integration for over 10 years. So really, Peter is one of the first people to be working on this topic. Most recently, he led the Parker project, which was collaborating with industrial uh, partners on vehicle to grid. Peter is also involved in policy development in Denmark through, for example, being a member of the Danish EV Alliance. I'm looking forward uh, to Peter's talk. If you have questions, please leave them uh, in the text box. Peter, over to you. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Miriam. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and thank you very much for the chance to uh, present uh, our work with you here today. Uh, before we begin, I just want to hear, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can see your screen. Perfect. Yes, but uh, thanks again, um, and thank you for everyone for participating. Uh, the title of this uh, webinar is A Sufficient and Intelligent Charting Infrastructure, Examples from Denmark. And as the title uh, kind of indicates, uh, the two topics uh, that I'll go through today is uh, kind of how we um, make sure that we are proactively uh, preparing a charting infrastructure which is both sufficient, so that's the first theme. It's a question of, of quantities, you can say. Uh, how will we make sure that we have enough charges at the right locations to facilitate electric cars? And the second theme is in, uh, that the infrastructure should also be intelligent so that that infrastructure can also support the electric vehicle's integration into the, the power system. Uh, and, and, and release the potential of flexibility that the electric vehicle represents. So under these two themes, sufficiency and uh, intelligence, uh, we'll start with the, the former. So a sufficient charging infrastructure. Just a quick background from, for, for Denmark. Uh, last year, uh, the then government 
of Denmark uh, proposed a ban on the sales of uh, combustion vehicles from 2030, and also a target of 1 million uh, green cars, green vehicles uh, for the same year, which we interpret mainly as being electric vehicles, uh, also perhaps with some, some plug-in hybrids. So this was kind of a, a first kind of significant target for, for Denmark and uh, would ex actually advance uh, the uh, introduction of electric vehicles into Denmark significantly. You can see how the orange line here is from our Danish energy agency was a like a former uh, forecast of EV introduction in Denmark. And you can see with the, the green line being the uh, government's uh, new target, which uh, you know brings us to this 1 million uh, cars already by uh, 2030. So well, when you look at that, you can also, you should keep in mind uh, the AFI directive, the European IFI directive that recommends this ratio of 10 to one between uh, electric vehicles uh, and public charging points. So for any, every 10 car on the road, there should be one publicly available charging point. So um, with a steep and aggressive increase in cars, you have to make sure that you can keep the, uh, a ratio like this, uh, even with the uncertainty on, on when these vehicles will, will actually arrive. So it's, it, this is important to understand when, when this infrastructure is needed. Uh, and the infrastructure is important. I think we know that both from you know studies and projects. This is a, a list of, of, of studies uh, which all try to identify central barriers for the introduction of electric mobility. And, and many of such studies uh, point at public, public uh, charging infrastructure or charging infrastructure all in all as one of the main central barriers for EV's diffusion in society. Uh, so we, we have heard it from experts. We also heard it from, from let's say, uh, potential car buyers. This is uh, a survey from Denmark from last year, where uh, people were asked uh, whether they thought it would be a challenge to charge an electric car, and a rather large part, like 40%, 41%, either fully agreed or mostly agreed in this statement. Uh, the participant was also asked uh, if they thought there would be too few public charges for electric cars and, and actually the majority of, of the respondees uh, thought that yes, they thought this could be the case. So uh, this again strengthens the, the idea that this is something we need to focus on. Uh, finally, this is more on an anecdotal, anecdotal uh, point, but uh, I had these pictures from a colleague last summer. Uh, we have a few places in Denmark where we have these large, rather large charging facilities, like with the, the Tesla parking facility here. And during uh, peak demand on a warm July day, uh, we actually have a, a real queuing situation right here in Denmark. So this is also a picture of what we could uh, foresee or expect in the future, unless we are making sure that we have enough charges. Um, right. So. With this in mind, what we did, uh, as in we, the Technical University of Denmark, was that we partnered with the Danish EV Alliance, which is a trade organization that counts a lot of, uh, for instance, energy companies and car OEMs, a lot of businesses and industries involved in, in electric mobility. And uh, we tried to do a, a, a study to understand the rough order of magnitude of the number of charging points needed in Denmark in 2030 to accommodate 1 million electric cars. Um, to kind of, to analyze the demand first, we have to make some assumptions. So I'm just gonna show you the, the main ones. First, we have to kind of understand where do we pe think people will actually charge their electric cars and what kind of charging power will they have available at those locations. If you see in the top, um, I like to differentiate between destination charging and charging destinations. Destination charging is when you charge at a kind of natural destination, uh, which is part of your natural driving and parking behavior. So this is part of your everyday life. So that's for instance, when you are parked close to your home, when you are parked at work, or when you are parked at, at errands or while doing shopping or entertainment or what else you do in, in your regular life. So, so this is destination charging. And for all the destination charging locations, you have 
what I would call like natural parking time. So this is where you already spend time with your vehicle. Uh, as a contrast, you have charging destination. That is somewhere you go with the main purpose of recharging your car. Uh, so for instance, that's kind of curbside charges in the cities. You have these clusters uh, in Copenhagen, for instance, of charges, uh, which, yeah, yeah, you have to go to a certain street or neighborhood to, to get to those charges. Or you have a charging station along the highways, uh, which is uh, similar to the gas stations we use today. So these are the two types, uh, destination charging and charging destinations. And then you would have uh, different uh, charging levels available at those locations. Uh, we also did kind of a, try to do a forecast in 2020, 25 and 30 of how these uh, charging powers are likely to evolve. So we think at least for Denmark that 11 kilowatt of charging will be like a, even a conservative minimum uh, universally available for home charging. And we will go up towards these 350 kilowatts uh, for day, uh, available for Danish uh, fast charging stations. And then the bottom I have this charge speed, which is how many kilometers you will have available after one hour of charge. Right, so that's where we expect you, you will charge, but also, how often will you actually need to charge? We also need to know how far can these vehicles actually go? Uh, we did, we divided into three segments, small, medium, large, and we looked at the battery capacity that we expect for each segment from in 2020 to 2030. And as you see, we don't really foresee like an explosion in the battery capacity. Uh, we, and this is in, in kind of in discussions with industry that we expect the, uh, the capacity to increase but then uh, it'll level out between, let's say, uh, 60, 80, or 100 kilowatt hours, and maybe the uh, OEMs will focus more on price or other aspects as the, the range becomes sufficient for, for most people. Uh, with these capacities and a certain consumption, you'll get a, a also a range spanning from 266 kilometers up to 500 kilometers, depending on the segment and the year in question. And uh, if you like, do a very simple uh, um, calculation and say in Denmark, a car drives 45.5 kilometers per day. That'll give you a maximum theoretical day between charges on anything between five and up to 10 days between uh, that you need to charge. So this is a very theoretical uh, number, but uh, let's say it, it's an indication that at least uh, you don't need to charge uh, more than maybe once or a few times a week in the future, which gives you more flexibility on, on when and how you, you choose to charge your electric car. So this is also an important development for the analysis. Um, and also a an, uh, last thing I would like to highlight is the cost. We uh, we looked at a different uh, charging categories. We used a, uh, this is actually taken from a Norwegian def definition where we use normal charging up to 22 kilowatt quick and fast charging. And for these different uh, power levels, we saw what is the cost, both the equipment, installation, commissioning. Uh, we didn't include land, which is also part of some fast charging installations. But we looked, tried to look at, at most cost associated with putting up a, a charging point. And what is significant or what was surprising for me is the large price difference between the different uh, solutions. So this, the, the difference between the cost of a, a, a normal charger up to 22 kilowatt is significantly different than if you want, let's say up to 350 kilowatt charger installed. Uh, which can reach up towards 240,000 uh, euros in Denmark. A lot of that is actually a net connection fee, uh, which brings up the cost considerably. So uh, you have to be critical of what kind of infrastructure you actually need. Anyway, so this is some of the assumptions. Then we also went on to look at how people are actually driving and parking today. So we used this large Danish uh, national travel survey uh, which is an interview survey uh, where uh, it's used to, uh, where, where Danes uh, are asked about their travel behavior for a particular day. This uh, survey has been started in 2006 until present. It has, uh, with some variations, been approximately 10 interview, 10,000 interviews per year. But actually, uh, through this study, we had access to uh, 
more than 160,000 interviews uh, in an age group between, uh, yeah, uh, most of the data is from 10 to uh, 84 year olds. So a lot of data we, we have been able to access. So with this data, the first thing we wanted to understand is how do people, how do Danes park at home? Um, and the reason why we asked that is to, to understand how many Danes would actually be able to home charge. Uh, so the more people that can charge at home, uh, we expect the less uh, public charging infrastructure we'll need. Um, so the three categories we have is parking space on private property. So that's when you can actually have, uh, you have a private parking on a driveway or your own garage. Uh, then we have a category for those who park at some parking space associated with where they live. This could typically be at like an apartment building where you have some kind of collective parking facility, making maybe a parking garage uh, that you have to share with all the people in that apartment. Uh, so uh, that's the second category. The last category are the, the, the Danes, uh, the people who actually don't have any reserved uh, parking uh, place at all, but will actually have to park a new place every night when they come home, typically maybe in the city center, uh, where they only, where they have to park wherever it's, it's available, wherever parking is available. So these are the, the three categories. If you look for Denmark, the entire Denmark, the vast majority actually has access to parking on private property. So the last vast majority of Danes based on this would have good conditions for establishing home charging. Uh, this, there's a middle group of around 20%, which is interesting because these people may have access to what we could call home charging, uh, but it depends on the conditions of these shared parking facilities, whether or not they will ultimately have something they can call home charging. Uh, and then finally, we have a group here around 12, 12 and a half percent who report that they would actually park uh, new places every night and would not have access to home charging. So this is Denmark in aggregate, but it's extremely different depending on what municipality you look at in Denmark. So I just took two examples here. If you look at, at Frederiksberg, which is the most densely populated municipality in Denmark, uh, the image is very different. Actually, one out of two would not have access to, let's say, would likely not have access to home charging since they use roadside parking. Um, and only 11% would able to, to charge on, uh, on private property, on their own private property. Uh, if you look at the uh, least uh, densely populated municipality in Denmark, Tønder, again, the picture is totally reversed and the vast majority would actually be able to charge where they live, would likely be able to charge where they live. So these geographical differences are very important. Uh, all right, so this all along, this is a good image, a good uh, message that a lot of Danes would actually be able to charge at home, but we have to look at this third column. We have to look, if electric mobility is to be for everyone, we have to make sure that everyone has a chance to, to charge. So especially in the city areas where a lot of people won't be able to home charge, we have to come up with a solution. So that's the reason why we asked the next question in, in the transport survey. We asked, all right then, uh, where else will these car cars be parked? Where else is there a chance to, to charge? And this is then a top 10 or favorite places where cars uh, like to stay parked when they're not parked uh, at, at people's, uh, close to people's homes. So this shows, uh, again, the 10 most uh, used parking uh, locations for, 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 for cars in Denmark in a percentage of park time, excluding home. Uh, this is the average parking time per stop. And then uh, you can clearly see that actually the workplace is the most uh, commonly used parking location uh, for cars in Denmark outside the home. So this is 57% uh, of all park time. So this and, and an average uh, parking time is uh, six hours and, and 51 minutes. So I, I guess then they like to, to have a, a shorter work days, uh, but, but still it's a, it's a lot of time. There's a big potential in workplaces, but also in some of the ones further down the list, uh, when you visit family, friends, will you be able to charge where they live, shopping, 
uh, entertainment, sports activities, etc. So there's other uh, in, uh, interesting possibilities. Again, if we put up a very theoretical example and say that you have actually have access to 22 kilowatt charging at all those locations, um, then you will actually, for one single stop with the average parking time, you will actually be able to cover a large percent of the entire week's uh, driving demand. And this is assuming like, again, the Danish uh, average uh, driving uh, need per week. So again, this is just an indication that there's a large potential in, in, in using these different types of, again, what I would call destination charging. So places where the car naturally sits and, and stays. Right. All right. And again, uh, finally, uh, for the analysis, uh, as I said before, it's very important for us to look at the differences between different municipalities in Denmark. These are shown here uh, on this map. So we looked at things like cars per household, which are very different depending on the municipality. Uh, daily kilometers driven. There's also regional differences in the greater Copenhagen area, our capital considerably less driven kilometers per day and also less uh, car ownership, by the way. Uh, then we had this uh, also how many people uh, will have has parking on private ground, which is again, very different from different regions uh, where you can again see that in the large cities, uh, there's actually a much fewer people who can, who can uh, uh, park uh, at where they uh, or have reserved parking. Uh, so this is very important, especially also this last element is very important when you consider how many public charging points you need for like day-to-day -day driving. We also, I'm not going to get into this uh, here, but we also had a, a, a also a rather simple study, but on, on how many charges you would need for doing long haul trips. Uh, but this is primarily how many charges you need for, again, for the people who need uh, to charge on a regular basis. Uh, on, 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 uh, on weekdays. So with all these perimeters, we did a study uh, and we tried to divide up the need for, for charges across these municipalities. And not surprisingly, by far the biggest need or concentration of public charging points for uh, everyday charging is in uh, the large cities in Denmark. That's where the vast majority of these uh, parking uh, charging points would need to be located. Uh, so all in all, uh, the main results from this study uh, are divided into three themes. For home charging, the conclusions were uh, the good news that the, the majority can, can, are likely to be able to charge at home. There is a large group who are using some kind of shared parking facilities where we have to make sure that we support that as many of these as possible have good parking, uh, good charging conditions at home. Um, but in the end, we think that this large group will only need to rely on public charging points for long haul trips, not on a day-to-day -day basis. For the long trips, uh, we also looked at the kilometers driven in Denmark. We calculated how many kilometers are driven every day for Denmark for, for trips exceeding 200 kilometers. And based on that, we came up with an estimate of a need of uh, additional 1,900 fast charging points in Denmark to cover these long haul trips. This is uh, uh, probably also a conservative number, uh, should be interpreted as, a, as, a, as we need to study more the, the peak demands uh, of, of these uh, fast charging facilities. And the final kind of uh, recommendation is to consider destination charging. Again, at least 12% 12, 12 of Danes will not have access to home charging and will rely on destination charging. So we need to look into these alternative locations, starting with uh, work, uh, the workplace, which has a very large potential, we think. But uh, all in all, we come up with an estimated need in Denmark for 25 and a half thousand destination points uh, for this daily charging demand. So all in all, uh, based on this first study, we have something in the order between 25 and 30,000 public charging points that we need in 2030 uh, with an investment need of between three and four billion Danish crowns. And this uh, 
will represent a, a ratio between charging points and EVs of 27 to 1. So actually, um, even though this should only be seen as a first study, we are we certainly have to uh, continue working on this and perfecting it. It indicates that we might actually need less charging point than we originally, let's say, feared. Uh, since if you compare to the uh, AFI directive again, it's actually less charges per car uh, than 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 again than this 10 to 1 ratio. Then finally, we together with the industry made out some some recommendations um, um, and, and I'm just going to read out the, the headlines I'm going to leave it to you to if you want to uh, read more but again the emphasis is is that we should port the bro broadest possible support for home charging uh, we should consider more fast charging points along highways and possibly collect them in in larger charging parks this is kind of known from Norway where you have uh, like these very large facilities where several operators may 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 have uh, charging infrastructure at the same locations, and this could uh, lead to some uh, some some positive effects of co-locating these uh, different charging infrastructures. And then define, finally, we have to emphasize this nation charging. We have to find out every place that a car natural naturally parks. We have to consider that as a good place to, to put in charges and that especially goes for, for, for our cities. Right. So again, this is a attempt to uh, a first attempt for us in Denmark to quantify our need for, for popping charging points. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, maybe you can ask them in the end of the presentation, but otherwise please don't uh, hesitate to reach out. Good. The second theme in, in my presentation is an intelligent infrastructure. Uh, again, uh, I'll take out this graph. I uh, apologize with the Danish uh, writing here. But again, this is again the forecast of EVs in, uh, introduction in Denmark. As I mentioned before, we do need public charges, but I think everyone agrees that the mass the majority, uh, majority of, of charges are going to be the, the ones that, that people will need at home. Uh, so home charges. So with these forecasts, uh, we foresee in Denmark that hundreds of thousands of, of Danes will buy home charges over the next 10 years. And the big question is, what kind of charges are that, those going to be? Uh, will they be intelligent or not? And maybe the first question is, what is an intelligent charger? What is an intelligent uh, home charging device? So I think this is something we have to find out, uh, make a definition for, and do it quite soon because before we have this uh, large uh, wave, hopefully, of people buying their first charging charger. For us, uh, we've been working uh, for many years within this area of vehicle grid integration. Also, before we knew that that was the, the name of this area. Uh, and we also, ultimately, we think it's important that the charges are, are, are intelligent so we can support the integration of vehicles into the, the power system. Uh, what we try to show in this picture is that if you have an electric vehicle and the uh, owner of that vehicle is willing to do so, that vehicle can be part, an active part or asset in supporting the power system at different levels. The owner may have to be incentivized or will have to be incentivized by different uh, uh, benefits, practical benefits, economic benefits, or it could be doing convictions, uh, perhaps for instance to support renewable, a renewable development of the power system, but for some reason that owner would have to allow the vehicle to become part of the system. The electric vehicle could then either be part of a building environment uh, where it supports this uh, uh, yeah, this intelligent energy optimized building, maybe with some energy autonomy uh, in conjunction with other resources at that building. The vehicle could also be part of a optimized neighborhood. Uh, there could be even in the future some peer-to-peer -peer activities. There could also be some uh, also some energy autonomy on, on the neighborhood level. Uh, or maybe the car has to be part of a uh, uh, supporting the local distribution system, so we don't uh, so we we avoid grid uh, high grid enforce, reinforcement costs. And finally, the car could indeed also be part of a whole region 
where the car could support uh, the introduction of renewables and the balancing of the uh, of, of that region in terms of power and energy. So there's a lot of things that the car can actually do if people get the right charger. Uh, we did a, back in the Parker project this uh, overview. It's a, we call it a catalog. It's really just a list of the different services that we think an electric vehicle can can do. Uh, I'm going to give you one example that I have already presented many times, but which is uh, a case from Denmark on one of these services. This is uh, one of the power balancing services, which is provided in a certain region, which is frequency containment. So this case has been uh, going on, I guess, now for approximately three years uh, at a company in, in Copenhagen, which is a utility company. Uh, and which serves, uh, yeah, more or less all the the residents of the, of the municipality of Frederiksberg. In this project, uh, the company has acquired a number of uh, Nissan electric uh, uh, EMV 200 electric vans, and all those vans are used during the day for for various maintenance and service tasks in the uh, business hours between seven and four. But what, what had then been done in this case is that these vehicles are also used uh, using bidirectional VTG units uh, to, to uh, actively uh, balance the power system by providing frequency reg regulation in the time where they're not used during the day. This is a very good case. Uh, here you can see some of the data from the, from, this is actually the 10 charges the 10 uh, DC charges that provide power to the uh, to the cars from one to 10. And this is the daily en energy use per day in kilowatt hours. And you can see that the energy consumption is quite low for these cars. This uh, indicates that the cars, uh, they don't drive that much during the day. Uh, you can also see for the same 10 charges, this is data showing the first departure the typical first departure of the of the cars and the last arrivals when the car arrive home and connect to the charging uh, spots. So this window where the cars are used are actually quite uh, narrow. So uh, uh, let's say until seven o'clock in the morning and after typically three or four in the afternoons, the cars are actually on, on, on utilized and can be used for, for this kind of service. So it shows that there's a lot of potential in using these uh, 10 cars. So in frequency regulation, um, what these cars would do is that using an aggregator developed by the, by the uh, company Nuvi, uh, those cars would, uh, would respond to the system frequency. In Denmark, we have the frequency of 50 Hertz and every time the, the frequency deviates from these uh, 50 Hertz, the cars would respond by either charging or discharging in a opposite proportional uh, matter. So a high frequency uh, indicates, let's say, a surplus of power in the power in the system, and the vehicle would then respond by using power by charging, and vice versa when the frequency drops, which significant uh, signifies uh, in a way a a uh, deficit or a a uh, lack of power in the in the system. So this has actually been gone on for these cars uh, for for a long time uh, for the. For the Parker project, we did some studies on the economic feasibility. So this is what has been reported by uh, Nuvi, the company uh, who are uh, economically uh, or uh, commercially running this pilot that has stated this earning, this uh, revenues from the uh, balancing market in Denmark on uh, averaging 1,860 euros per car per year. Uh, in parallel, in the, in the project, uh, I tasked a different company in zero with coming up with, with their calculations on how much you could earn. And they, their uh, result was actually a bit lower, but it was around 1,287 uh, euros per car per year in revenue. But very importantly, there's a lot of factors that influence how much you can actually earn from this service. So there's a big difference between what they would consider best case and worst case in terms of revenue. And if you look at profit, 
uh, in the worst case scenario, you could even lose money on providing the service. So there are some of the factors, for instance, the price of, of, of this service, the costs of the energy associated with, with provo providing the service. There's a lot of factors that influence the, the actual business case. But what I think we, we proved in Denmark that at least in Denmark for this particular service, there is a potential for profit. And uh, just because this is a very common question <laughs> about battery degradation, I can just say that we are in a, a follow-up project uh, called ACES. Uh, we are investigating the impacts on, on battery lifetime that, that providing this, uh, let's say, very aggressive type of, of, of service is uh, impacts on the battery. So this is also something we are looking very much forward to, to publish. Right. Uh, finally, for the Parker project, we we could see from based on on the case in Flexbear that we could provide this uh, kind of uh, of service, but we also tried to uh, do the same with other brands of electric cars. So we were partnering both with Nissan, but also with the PSA and Mitsubishi, and with four different cars from three different brands, uh, we did some testing. Uh, we sh this black line you can see is a uh, kind of a control set point signal over 10 minutes uh, that kind of represents the behavior when you're providing frequency regulation. So again, a very aggressive uh, case. And you can see how it, it very suddenly uh, jumps between positive and negative power, meaning that the, uh, the alternate between either charging or discharging the cars. And what we could see actually is that all these uh, different cars uh, could follow this signal very, very accurately. So that's, of course, very good news. The very important thing to state that is that this was also enabled by this special DC charging spot, uh, this uh, developed by NLX, uh, uh, this charging uh, DC-based charging spot that allowed these cars to provide uh, bi-directional uh, grid services. And this was done during the uh, chat demo uh, protocol. So you could say this charger was actually the uh, one of the uh, key enabling technologies in, in realizing this very nice uh, behavior from the cars. So it kind of, I think this charger is something you, it's already uh, produced and you can buy it, but it's certainly not the norm. So we have to find out if we can expect uh, somewhat similar uh, capabilities with the chargers that people will buy. As uh, Miriam mentioned in the beginning, uh, I think uh, the UK is very progressive in, in, in making regulations about the requirements for charges. Um, so this is uh, from a draft from this electric vehicle uh, smart charge points regulation 2020, which I guess yeah should step into force next year. Uh, but, but ultimately it, it, it'll cover kind of the requirements uh, for uh, what should be required from, for, for all charges being uh, installed uh, in the future. And I think very clever, in a very clever way, the, there's, there will be this uh, law that puts the high level requirements and then the uh, British Standards Institution, PSI, will, will describe kind of the, the more detailed uh, requirements uh, for the charges. Uh, I think this is very, uh, it's a very good source of inspiration and I hope we can do something similar in Denmark. Together with, again, with the Danish Trade Organization, uh, we have a very draft also proposal on what should be required. Uh, the high level kind of requirement would be that a charging spot must use open standards to facilitate secure bi-directional communication between an electric vehicle and a trusted third party providing the necessary information controllability and performance to support dynamic charging control. So this is our attempt. So the more main keywords here is that it should use open and standards. Uh, of course, the communication has to be secure and bi-directional. So in order to connect a third party, for instance, an aggregator and the car, uh, we should all have all the necessary information on which to operate. The controllability should be sufficient and also with a certain performance. Uh, the performance is especially important if you want to do dynamic charging control. Uh, with dynamic charging control, I mean that you will be actually able to, on very short notice, change 
at least the active uh, charging power uh, through a control signal. So let's say in a matter of seconds, we still don't have any strict definition, I guess, or requirement on what dynamic and fa how fast is fast enough, but at least it should be within a, a matter of seconds. Um, in order to achieve that, we need a controller inside the charging spot with the main, fo main following functions. We should have access to the control supported by the EV to EVSE interface. It should also uh, access all the information that is available through the electric vehicle to EVSE interface, supplemented by the charger's own measurements uh, coming uh, primarily from its meter. And then finally, all that control and information should then be made available to this trusted third party using an open standard. So these are kind of the steps which are needed before you can, uh, we, we are, as a draft requirement, uh, we will set forward for, for a charging spot. Uh, some very important notes uh, so far is that when we do this uh, definition, we assume a centralized control from a, a trusted third party, uh, but where the EVSC is, is an intermediary between the EV and that party. We have also, there's also other schemes, for instance, where this uh, third party can communicate directly with the car, but, but we think that the norm uh, in foreseeable future is having a charging spot as an intermediary. Uh, with this definition, I know I use the word intelligent a lot, but I, it can be discussed whether this really is intelligence, but it expresses that the charger uh, should make best possible use of the available standards, uh, which interface it with the cars and with the uh, third, third party uh, aggregators. And you could also say that you can make the best possible chargers but they are at all time kind of constrained to the capabilities of the standards available. So uh, I put down some of the standards, which I guess uh, most of you working with, with electric car know, but uh, some of the interesting standards is of course our 61851, uh, which allows uh, charge limiting of the vast majority of the electric vehicles on the market today, but also with in mind the upcoming capabilities of 1518, uh, and 63, 110, which I am happy to see that uh, Miriam already have covered in either uh, past or, or future webinars. Right. So just to say, we are also working uh, with these requirements in Denmark. And again, we hope that that, that putting in these uh, requirement will make sure that, that the cars can be used in all the ways that we have imagined so far. Uh, I would like to compare that to the charges we actually have at DTU right now, because as a, as a university, you would expect that, that we have intelligent charges, right? Uh, I mean, we should have uh, smart charges when, when that is what we preach. But actually, it's, it's not so simple. Uh, the charges, the picture I have here is actually my, char my car charging from, from one of our AC uh, charges. Uh, it has the components it needs to be intelligent. It has a communication controller. It has a meter, so you can measure the, the power and energy. Uh, and it also have charging control. So it has the, a Phoenix uh, module that allows you to control uh, or, or put in a, a charging limit according to 61851. So if you use the criteria from before, can we, is this then an intelligent, intelligent charger? So the first criteria is that you can access the charging control supported by the EV to AVC interface. And this is, you could say this is medium, this is somehow achieved because we only have, with the cars we have access to this charge limiting during 61851. So this is a, it's a very simple mechanism um, where the, you could say the best thing that could be said is that it works with most if not all cars are available. So we are actually able to go in and control via a, a ampere, ampere limit how much the car charges. And we can do so within relatively few seconds, uh, between one and two seconds. So it is also in a way dynamic. So it's, it's, it's like a medium. Then uh, the next criteria was access to information available uh, through the EV to AVC interface supplemented by own, men, own measurements. This is also kind of a, a medium uh, 
we actually don't have any real detailed information available through 61850, uh, or, or rather the uh, the uh, the PVM signaling through the communication pilot uh, control pilot. Uh, we know a little about what the state of the vehicle is, but we don't have any information like state of charge or anything else. Uh, but what you do with this device is, of course, that we make uh, all the measurements in the meter available uh, to a, the, the, our own aggregate that can access this, uh, this charger. So this is also so-so. <laughs> and then the final uh, requirement is that you make bulk control and information available through a open standard. And this is actually somewhere where we fail. Uh, we are still using at the university a proprietary uh, standard to access our communication controller. Uh, but in our defense, we still need, you know, that the, 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 the interface of the standards that would allow us to do uh, uh, like dynamic, dynamic charge control are not finalized yet. So we uh, would very much continue to work on um, uh, some of the standards I listed previously, including 1511.8, when they have this dynamic uh, control available and when they become available. But well, again, what we can do right now is to make charges that Best possible, you make you best possible use of those charge, those standards available. So we still have a little way to go, uh, and then my fi final uh, kind of slide or word is that uh, thankfully we are focusing a lot on this, and we have many uh, students working on on this topic. So this is actually taken uh, a few weeks ago with one of our new. Uh, groups uh, of students or future uh, engineers who are working on exactly how you control the charging of, of an electric car. So with that, I actually would like to end uh, my presentation and then I will open up for, for any questions that might be. Peter, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. I'm really sorry. About this, that was the worst timing ever for our internet connection to uh, to drop. Uh, okay, I did have a really good question from Bjorn, uh, who asked if um, and now I cannot uh, see it anymore. But it, uh, I'm going to try and rephrase. Uh, I think Bjorn asked, "Do we uh, do we roll out a charging infrastructure to meet the peak demand in terms of days?" We, um, in, in regard if, to... If Bjorn is still with us, if he can write it again to make sure I took it, I, I rephrased it correctly. But yeah, if, if you did, if you can take it, Peter, that would be good. Yeah, if I understand it correctly, it's a question on uh, how we kind of dimension the uh, infrastructure, uh, public charging infrastructures especially. That's a really good question. <laughs> Thank you, Bjorn. And uh, it is quite difficult. What we did in this study is that we talked to some of the uh, uh, charging spot operators on the uh, utilization rate of their charges. And uh, what they what some have done, I think this is, uh, yeah, what, what some of them quoted was a, when they have a utilization of around 15%, of their fast charges. So when they're used around 15% of the time, they actually start considering putting on in a, 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 a new one because already at that low utilization, they'll start seeing queues uh, when, when the demand is as, as, it, at, as its uh, highest. But whether 15 uh, percent of utilization is correct is a very good question. It's a trade-off between on one hand, you want as high utilization as possible to uh, recoup your costs for putting up the charger. But on the other hand, there's a limit to how much uh, queue or wait time your customers will accept on those uh, busy days. And the, the tough thing with this infrastructure is that the demand uh, varies so extreme. Uh, there's so extreme variations between uh, demand, low and high demand, uh, that you, you have really have to consider how you're gonna dimension uh, based on your high demand. But we had we had these utilization factors for the different types as a function of the charging power. Uh, so the faster the charger, the, the lower the utilization uh, factor, utilization rate. 
And it is excellent to what you use, destination charging versus charging destination. And some of the analysis you've done in that report based on the travel survey, I'm assuming that report is only available in Danish. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, I only I translated the figures and such in these slides. We we did like an executive summary, which is like four pages, and it may make sense to try to have that translated. Uh, yeah, that would definitely, I think, be useful to uh, a lot of countries trying to answer this question of um, how many chargers we need and where. And from your studies, it seems it is very important to take the regional particularities in consideration because some municipalities had longer driving distances while others didn't, and some had access to private parking while others didn't. Yes, I hope uh, I hope we can. Uh, I hope we can share it because we also it would be very good with uh, some feedback because we think yeah. this is we think this is a kind of a instrument that we will reuse and and continuously adjust. It it remind me uh, it reminded me a bit of the EV Pro tool that was developed by Andrel in the US to also try and understand how much charging infrastructure is needed and where. Anyway, um, uh, I got a question about um, given the challenges. So this is a question from Chris from Shell. Given the challenges with the high capital cost and low utilization, uh, do you think there is a role for government support while volumes of electric vehicles grow and we see more and more usage of this infrastructure? Yes, that is actually that is actually what we uh, recommend that they somehow intervene. Uh, there is a discussion on making like a uh, charging infrastructure uh, fund or, or make funds available uh, devoted for charging infrastructure in Denmark. An argument is to say that, you know, in, in Denmark, to a large degree, uh, the, the installation of, of charges has been driven by industry on a commercial basis. But now that we actually have a political target, which is, let's say, most significantly the span on combustion cars uh, in 2030, you know, you have a politically driven introduction of electric cars, which is in a way more aggressive and more fast than, than, than it would be maybe otherwise. And therefore, the government also has a role in, in facilitating the infrastructure for this uh, inter introduction of electric cars. So because there's a, a target for, for the cars, there must also be like support and a target for, for the infrastructure. That's kind of the, the argument here. Uh, Together with so the, there are the plans management. in Denmark. So there are plans in Denmark to have some support to roll out, uh, like funding support to roll out charging infrastructure. Yes, it's still being discussed how large this will be and how it will be distributed. But yeah, that's it's it's on the drawing board. Yeah, it it is interesting to that it uh, that you have a ban, actual ban on the sales. Uh, do, do you think? Uh, Elect uh, car makers will make enough electric vehicles to help you reach your targets? That's another very good question. Uh, what we have learned from the Danish car importers is that the um, amount of models available for sale in Denmark will increase significantly. Uh, they even go so far to say that within a few years, uh, you should have the same uh, number of, of brands available to you in EVs as you used to have uh, for, for combustion cars in Denmark. Uh, so this uh, brand bias, which has also been a factor to hold back electric vehicles, where people uh, prefer a specific brand over another, that should also kind of uh, improve uh, in Denmark. Uh, but it's still, of course, it's a question whether there'll be uh, enough available. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Peter, do you, have a, do you have a bit more time for a couple more questions? Yes, sure. Okay, here we go. So um, uh, you mentioned dynamic charging, discharging by vehicles in response to grid frequency. Uh, are there cars that currently do uh, FFR themselves or still managed by the charger? Uh, I'm assuming maybe the, the question here is that you, you maybe touched on it is that this is about the charger control versus car control. Yes. To my knowledge, there's no kind of uh, outside of you know the outside of project or experimental settings. There's no car that can can do this uh, uh, frequency regulation by themselves. 
it's uh, technically it's a possibility for sure absolutely How? like what the car or the car uh, whoever is controlling the car would sense the frequency and accordingly uh, send the control signal to the car itself yeah if i understand the question correct uh, is that you know if the car itself internally measures the frequency and can control the this would be for for ac onboard charging uh, i guess uh, but but in that case, you could have the car uh, responding autonomously to the uh, to the frequency. Okay, that's that's a possibility. So, so we can see. So most likely, because of the funding, because of how things are going, we're seeing the future pathway is the control from the charger. But nothing can stop us from directly uh, having the car responding, right? Right. It's technically possible. Uh, but but the framework as it is now would 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 necessitate uh, that you you know you have some kind of aggregating device, uh, and 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 you need some balanced responsible party to be part of providing that kind of service, yeah. and to earn and money I, on it. And I suppose the advantage would be uh, of the aggregating device that you're optimizing other devices around, like in the home, for example, if you have a charger, if you have a solar system. You're optimizing local uh, resources. Yes. By, by allowing could, this aggregation. You could use synergies between different uh, types of resources if you are aggregating at a higher level. Or at least it, it may be a bit easier to do it if you are aggregating uh, from from a higher from a higher level. Yeah. Uh, there's also other things you, that you could do to better optimize. If you have a, a large portfolio of cars, you can divide the response depending of. Uh, which cars are at a specific state of charge or does have a special need somehow. So you can also uh, kind of optimize in your portfolio uh, if, 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 you are, if you have this centralized approach. Okay. Uh, okay. It's a larger discussion whether we ultimately will have a more uh, a distributed control, uh, but, but this is a kind of, here we have a time frame within five years uh, up to 10 years. So therefore, we, we, this is focused on having a, a centralized uh, control. Maybe this links back to the point you made about the IEC 63110 uh, and also the OCPP that is widely used now. Do you foresee in the future that a charging manufacturer, for example, would need to implement both IEC 63110 that is supposedly would allow the communication to an energy management system and OCPP that is right now used? I guess that 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 uh, you know uh, OCPP has been like the de facto standard uh, for many years, but I I think the new standards will kind of ultimately take over. Uh, it may take over. Uh, as far as I know, the in the work group for the new standard, there's kind of both uh, inputs from the OCPP team. And also from uh, one another standard called uh, 61850, uh, originally made for substation automation, yeah. some information models. And, so and, they, and we, yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, so there will there will be uh, yeah, there may be a need for two, but but hopefully maybe it'll just be uh, one standard that needs to be uh, be implemented. So yeah, we'll hear a webinar on it specifically. And one thing I'm interested to know is when do we expect the standard to be ready? Because if a charging manufacturer is ready to develop some solutions, we cannot expect them to wait for a couple of years because the standard is not ready. And definitely we don't want them to develop their own proprietary protocols. Nope. I'm also looking forward to, to hear more about that. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, you emphasize on smart charging. We also emphasize on smart charging because we want to try and integrate those cars synergetically with the power system and try and reduce reinforcement costs, etc. cetera. Um, do you have insights on if there is also emphasis on smart charging in Norway, considering that their distribution system is strong, has been designed for electric heating and can take demand from electric cars probably without uh, facing issues we would face in the UK? Mm, I think there's more emphasis in, in Norway on that now than, than there have been, but I'm not, I'm not aware if, how far that is. 
uh, and, and whether they have a they, they'll kind of mandate this uh, smart charging. Okay. Uh, I think, and you say, and that's correct, that the, the, they, they have a, a generally a quite strong uh, distribution system. There's one, I think, very interesting aspect about uh, this uh, control of charging, and that is that it's, it, it can really act as a, a, a a, a dual age, age sort. It can either be good or it can be bad. Um, you can use, if, if you just consider, we're doing a different study where we're looking uh, now at, the, at the, the coincidence factor of electric vehicle charging. When, when you have larger batteries and, uh, and also a higher charging power, it, it influences the likelihood that more cars will charge at the same time. But what we see in general is that there'll be a, a quite a nice spread in, in, in charging. So left alone, I, it's not, I think in many cases, the cars will not over, overload the distribution system when you don't start manipulating the charging. But I do think ultimately that, that we will be able to control these uh, charging spots. And then the question is, who will do that? Because if they charge them in a way that totally ignores the distribution system, they will actually create a problem that was not there before. Uh, so I think the control will be there. It's just very important that that control is also used to, to sort, support the system because otherwise it will actually use, uh, make the coincidence factor or the, the charging simultaneity much worse instead of better. Uh, unless you actually just ban uh, charging control, and I don't think that's a good way either. Um, so it's not just that you have this charging control, it's also how it's used is, is at least as important. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, back to your first, uh, first part of the presentation, what was the ratio of uh, charging infrastructure or charging station needed per electric vehicle? Well, we, we kind of read that the uh, recommended, ultimately, the, I think the AFI say it's up to the member countries to, to put in a target. But uh, meanwhile, we also read that the recommendation is one to 10. So for each 10 cars, uh, you should have one publicly available charging point. Uh, and what we found was around, let's say up to, yeah, let's say 20, 27 uh, to one, or maybe up to 30. Uh, to one instead. So that's only one charging point per 30 or 27 to 30 cars. Uh, okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, we have a question uh, from um, uh, the audience. It says OCPP is a protocol which a lot of CPOs, so the charge point operator are currently using. But if uh, he's not mistaken, it's not standardized by IEC or ISO. So the goal of IEC 63110 is to be standardized and be an international standard. So I suppose, yes, they, uh, uh, they were making a comment on how OCPP and IEC 63110 links. And hopefully we'll hear that IEC 63110 will be ready soon because people cannot wait for a standard version. They just want to start developing those chargers. Uh, back to your second um, uh, second uh, um, part of the presentation, you spoke about vehicle to grid chargers, actual vehicle to grid chargers in real world. Are you able to share some information if they cause power quality issues? Uh, what is their efficiency of these chargers? If there's a lot of losses between charging and discharging, are we impacting the actual business case? Yes, so for these particular charges, um... Well, what we saw and what is, I guess, uh, is, is, is universal to, to most of these charges is that you, they have, they have a quite good efficiency if you are, are operating them at their rated level. Uh, so if you are operating at, at the maximum uh, power, then the efficiency is quite good, let's say 90% uh, plus. And we also expect that the efficiency would, will even be better. Uh, these were kind of some quite uh, early products, so that there is room for improvement. Um, yes, yeah, so at, at least the, the efficiency is, is, should be, I, I guess, ultimately up to maybe 95% if you, if you operate them at full power. Uh, but if you use them for, for stuff like frequency regulation, it, it, it shows that it's much better to, 
let's say, run two units at full power than running four units at, at, at half power, because the, the efficiency will then be much worse for, for those four units. Two more questions. Um, what do we need to change to allow these charges to, uh, to control, so for reactive power control? Because as far as I know, this is not possible. Yeah, we, we had hoped initially there was kind of the plan that, that the charges would also support reactive power control, but uh, ultimately that, that didn't materialize. So in, in, in the Parker project, we only did like a, a, a analysis, a computer uh, analysis on, on, on the potential of providing frequency regulation. We would have liked to test it. So uh, that would also be a first if a project managed to, to use uh, DC charges to provide this, uh, at least to my knowledge, to provide this uh, reactive power. Uh, and also we are kind of in doubt whether this will actually be a, either a product or it could also just be a, requ a requirement. Um, we have a, a new technical requirement in Denmark uh, that actually requires uh, V2G cars to provide, at least to be able to provide reactive power. Okay, thank you. And the last question, uh, this is similar to the question I was going to ask. So uh, in Parker, you used uh, DC chargers with the CHAdeMO protocol. Uh, do you see that we can use AC chargers soon? Uh, do you see there will be a battle between DC and AC or this is not relevant? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, yes, as you said, we use DC chargers because that has been, if nothing else, that's kind of the shortcut to doing vehicle to grid. You have all the power conversion and ele power electronics inside the charger, uh, which, uh, which you can use uh, to access uh, uh, bidirectional power. Uh, and that was again uh, using Tdemo, the newest version of the Tdemo protocol that allowed uh, this uh, VGD control. Uh, for AC charging, I'm aware of products uh, where the kind of bidirectional AC cars are, are, are built and tested. And uh, from what I've, I've heard, uh, that, that this is uh, successful. We also worked in the past with a, I think we worked with one of the world's first. AC, bidirectional AC cars that we bought, purchased from the United States. So we know that this is, is certainly possible. In the end, uh, you know, there's arguments both ways. There's something to do with cost. Uh, how much can you bring down the cost of the equipment in the charger versus the, the cost of the equipment in the car? Um, and ultimately, where, where will the manufacturers like to place that cost? Uh, DC charges, DC V2D charges, the main limit right now is that it, it's, they are quite expensive. Uh, and the price is, question is really how, how far down will the uh, DC charges come in price? Uh, so that it's, it's likely that people will buy DC charges for their, for their homes. Uh, right now, I think they are, the, the cost is too high, but, but it, it, true mass uh, economy of scale, it should be able to bring that down. Uh, if we implement kind of this functionality in a, a uh, in the car, at least uh, at least it, it it should be able to make it uh, cheaper to implement this capability. But then it's up to the OEMs whether they want to implement it or not in the car. Great, uh, Peter. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your insights. And I would like to apologize about the internet connection issue I had earlier. Uh, any parting thoughts? Would you uh, would you like to end with anything? No, I think just uh, again, thank you for participating. And, and I, if you have any further feedback or comments or questions, please uh, send me an email. I would love to, uh, to discuss with you uh, kind of also how we continue uh, in Denmark and beyond on, on putting on requirements on charging infrastructure. Uh, so uh, yeah, thank you again. Great, thank you so much, Peter. Goodbye. Goodbye.